Come on and magnify the Lord. We declare, we decree, we profess, we proclaim, none like him anywhere. Anybody feel like praising God? He's worthy of praise tonight. Come on, open your mouth. I can't hear you. Magnify the Lord. Clap your hands. Father, I magnify you tonight. I glorify you. I praise you. I lift you up because there's none like you in the universe. Thank you for keeping us all day long. Thank you for allowing us to come out tonight, open our hearts to the word of God. We might be able to have a fresh revelation, process it in our mind, live it out in our lives. Thank you that there's none like you in the universe. Nobody like you anywhere. None like you. And we're glad to be able to proclaim that, profess it, decree it, declare it until every angel, every demon, every, any, everybody that needs to hear and know there's none like you. Now, take complete control of everything that's going on. We're still thanking you for 45 years of your faithfulness and, and kindness and mercy. Open our hearts uh, and for a few short moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise God. Amen. Go on, when you sit down, tell somebody, nobody like him. There's nobody like him. On the other side, tell them, I almost praise God. I, it was a little cold for me. I feel I almost praise God there. What can wash away my sin? What can make me hold again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. We've been working on that for 22 weeks. We'll try to get in here and get you out because you got to get home and get your dress ready and your stuff ready for Friday night. You get your dance shoes out and all that stuff. Part four, scapegoat chapter nine. We're now dealing with the scriptures on the scapegoat and I'm just plodding my way through. Um, I, I'm, I'm so far beyond reading other books and doing stuff. But when I start something, I hate to stop in the middle. So I'll just keep working the two. What's so many of y'all doing out here tonight? What's wrong? Y'all don't know it was cold? All right, you wanted to come out with the saints and get warmed up. John 1, 29, 36. It's, it's so cold outside, you probably ought to just sit down. I don't want you to stand up. You'll, you'll probably fall out or something. John 1, 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Word of God. Go ahead and sit down. You ain't got to get up no more. I know you honor the word of God. Now you wouldn't be out here tonight. Remember what we used to say. You come on Sunday morning, you like the church. You come on Sunday evening, you like the pastor. You come on Wednesday night, you love the Lord. Okay. Myers believes that Gospels contain scapegoating themes on almost every page. That's logical for the writer of this book. And if the sin of scapegoating is the primary sin of humanity from the foundation of the world, we've been talking about the scapegoat mechanism, then the primary task of Jesus would be to deliver us from the slavery of our sin, both by exposing it and showing us how to live differently. One of the primary ways that Jesus exposes the truth about scapegoating is by becoming a scapegoat himself. He exposed himself to the scapegoat mechanism so that he might unveil it, dismantle it from within. It, it takes us a little while to understand that it's tough to try to tear down something from the outside. You need to be on the inside. So Jesus came on the inside and started. I think Stokely Carmichael and H. Rap Brown figured that out after a while. We can't deal with the system on the outside. We got to get on the inside. And so the first explanation of the scapegoat mechanism is in John 1, 29 and 36. And these two verses, Jesus is declared the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Some teachers assume that the verse is talking about the Passover lamb, but the law never describes the lamb as taking away the sin of the world. In fact, there is no lamb of any kind in the Mosaic law that takes away sin. So what lamb is he referring to? Most likely, probably Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 and 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. 
yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before her shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Isaiah 53 is full of scapegoat Im imagery, but rather than calling the suffering servant the scapegoat, he refers to him as the lamb. The Lamb of God fulfills the scapegoat function with one major exception that you ought to know by now because I keep saying it over and over and over again. He is not guilty of any sin. Please remember that the human scapegoats are almost, or they're usually guilty of some of the things that they are accused of, but Jesus exposes the scapegoat mechanism by being completely innocent of all wrongdoing. He exposed the mechanism as the wrongful accusation of an innocent victim. He reveals that most scapegoats, although accused, condemned, and killed just like him, they are mostly innocent. They, he is pointing out that when we get people and blame them, they may not be as blameworthy as we want to make them. Y'all don't like it when I talk about you, do you? You like it better when we talk about Jesus, but we are the ones who find people who we need to blame when something isn't going right. And when John says that Jesus takes away the sin of the world, are y'all here? Yeah. You ain't got to be here long because I can't keep you long because it's too cold out. You got to go out and get ready for Friday. He's not talking about perhaps the summation of individual sin, but the foundational sin of humanity. Not God takes away the little itty bitty sins that each one of us does, but God takes away the foundational sin with a capital S of humanity. Perhaps he's talking about scapegoating. He's taking away the sin of the world. He's taking away the sin of the world. Perhaps... Oh, this is so messed up. Not by bearing it, but by exposing it. So that the mechanism can never be blindly used again. He takes away sin by revealing it for what it is. The murder of innocent victims to create a false peace. Jesus' mission and message is that we must stop accusing and murdering scapegoats and adopt his way of peace through love and forgiveness. I mean, what would the church look like if we stopped talking about one another? What would the church look like if we stopped blaming one another for the things that go wrong or we think are wrong? And so, Luke 11:49, I'm halfway done. And through 51, now don't, don't make me get started because you know if I get cranked up, I'll still go along. But I'm trying to get out early. Luke eleven forty nine 49 through 51. For this reason, also the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, and some they will persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. And may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. I mean, this is a serious, serious set of verses. Very enigmatic. You probably have never even seen them before, even though you've read through the Bible many times. How many of you read through the Bible before? How many times do you figure out when you read through the Bible again, you didn't read through it before? <laughs> okay, stuff starts coming up. And you say, well, I know I, I know I read through the Bible, but I don't remember that. But there's a whole lot of Bible to remember. And so this set of verses is very enigmatic. I preached it at the last prophetic conference. You certainly wouldn't have been there for that. So I got to talk about it tonight. These verses speak to what Gerard calls the anthropological meaning of the cross. The theological meaning of the cross reveals what God was doing on our behalf through Jesus Christ. The anthropological meaning of the cross reveals what humanity was doing at the cross. Not what God was doing, what we were doing. The anthropology of the cross reveals the violence that is in the heart of humanity and at the center of human culture. And that truth is also hidden except through the power of the Holy Ghost. So you're not going to see it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm preaching about it, hoping that the Holy Ghost will penetrate our hearts and our consciousness and we will begin to see how violent we really are. But for me to stand up here and tell you you're violent, you're, you're saying in your mind, I'm not that violent. I, I, I'm really not that bad. I mean, I killed a couple people, but you're 
know. Uh, I'm, I'm, not that, I'm, I'm not that bad about it because you can't see it. It's hidden by the devil. It's hidden by the culture. So I'm going to ask God to open our eyes like Elisha asked God to open the eyes of his servant when the army of Syria came to capture him because some of these things you cannot see unless God opens your eyes. The Bible is written, and, and I'm going to do some more preaching on this from Wingren's perspective. The Bible is written so that we might find ourselves in the text. It's basically um, a narrative, and the narrative is for you to go in there, look, see if you can see who you are, and then begin to live the living word of the text. Not, not propositionalize it, not do all that stuff, but to live it out in the epic nature of, a, of, the, of the way it is written. So in these verses, Jesus talks about the wisdom of God that said that he would send to the Israelites prophets and apostles and messengers and that some of them they would kill, some they would persecute and stone. But what he says next is shocking. I'm not sure anybody can get it. He sent the apostles and the apostles so that the blood of all the prophets since the found foundation of the world might be charged against that generation now that's nothing we ever heard before i've never heard any sermons on, on that i heard the sermons he sent the prophets so that people might be saved he sent the prophets so they could get a prophecy he said he said i sent them because i want the the, the blood to be charged to that particular generation the blood of all the prophets that had been shed from the foundation of the world to the current rep generation represents the total of violence of humanity. The writer demarcates the prophets from Abel, the first of the prophets, to the priest, Zeremiah, Ze uh, Zechariah, who is the last of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible, who was killed between the altar and the house of God. You're lost, aren't you? You should be. Unless you've done a whole lot of reading, I don't know about you, should be real lost. Why? Because Abel is treated as the first prophet. Abel was the first prophet to be violently murdered for standing for God. His brother killed him because God accepted his sacrifice. And this writer said he's like the first prophet ever and his blood was shed for standing for God. When you stand for God, sometimes you get killed. By the way, the, the early church uh, fathers believed that the greatest honor they could have was to be martyred. We believe the greatest honor we could have is to be delivered. They believed the greatest honor was to be martyred. Why? To be martyred was to be made and conformed to the image of Jesus and join him in his death, which automatically joined him to his resurrection. Today I preached at the funeral. I don't know if they understood what I was talking about or not, but I preached it anyway. Death is always connected to resurrection. The reason we have the problem we have is because we separate death from resurrection or resurrection from the death. If you separate and only and concentrate on death, then you get all messed up and depressed and you don't understand and we go in the past and we treat it as a historical event, but it has no present and future impact. If we take the resurrection and separate it from death, then resurrection has no physical conflict, no, no trouble, no struggle that you have to go through and therefore we begin to treat it as if it is psychological and not real. But Death is always connected to resurrection because Jesus died and he rose again. The ground couldn't hold him. And when we accept Jesus as our personal savior, we are buried with him and we are resurrected with him. Death is always connected to resurrection in the Bible. I feel like preaching what I preach this afternoon, but let me go on. I'm trying to get you out early. Don't hurt. Don't say amen. Leave me alone. Zechariah was the last prophet before Jesus to be violently murdered for standing for God. So he said all the way from Abel, the first prophet, to the last prophet, Zechariah, represents all of the violence of humanity that had been going on for that particular point. Why did God want that violence to be charged against the current generation? He wanted human violence to be charged against the generation because the current generation was the generation that would perpetrate the ultimate violence. What would they do? Crucify Jesus Christ. Attempt to kill God. Now, a lot of y'all are just sitting and saying, oh, my God. I mean, who would want to do that? You kill him every day. 
When you don't allow him in your life, when you don't allow him to speak to you, when you don't allow him, you kill him every day. So the current generation would attempt to offer Jesus as the scapegoat to solve the problems of Israel, which we'll see in a minute. And the current generation would attempt to murder the Son of God and God the Son. The current generation represents the sum of human violence. Jesus would reveal the violence of humanity on the cross. Jesus would reveal the scapegoat mechanism through his giving of his life. Jesus would reveal that it was not God who was violent, but it was people who were violent. Jesus revealed that God didn't want a sacrifice, but religious people of the generation, they wanted a sacrifice. Y are y'all sure y'all here? Because this is, this is turning things upside down. God was sending the current prophets and apostles to stand for God and reveal that the current generation was responsible for the violent murder of anything that was related to God all the way to the murder of the Son of God. And so I preach to the prophets, and, and I'm sure they'll remember, that God sent you and called you to die. They thought God sent them to give a prophecy. But he called them to die, that when you stand up for certain kinds of things, the word of God can only become effective when you give your life for it in a certain way in order to make it real. So Jesus delineates that blood that was shed, the blood from Abel to the blood of Zechariah who perished between the altar and the temple, and Jesus mentions the altar. Perhaps to point out that the sin of scapegoating is primarily a religious sin. All these apostles, all these prophets were killed in the name of God. We are never more blind than when we perpetrate violence in the name of God. So one of the strange features of the scapegoat mechanism is that the scapegoat victims often become venerated heroes in later generations. Jesus indicated this well by pointing out that while their Jewish ancestors killed the prophets, later Jewish people built tombs to venerate the prophet. Ironically, people rarely learn from the scapegoating practices of the past, but they continue to engage in them even in their own day. Jesus said that this is what this generation would do with him. Though every generation says if they had lived in the days of the prophets, they would not have killed them. Every generation has its own prophets, which we kill. I don't think you got it, did you? We have our own prophets who don't fit what we think they ought to fit, who don't look like we think they ought to look like, because prophets are strange people. They're individualists. They stand out from everybody else. And therefore, they are great targets for killing. We kill people that don't look like us. We kill people that look strange. We kill people that stand out. So that's why most of us have figured out, what am I going to do? Blend in. People won't, they won't bother me. But Jesus came to bring an end to all such scapegoating, and he did that by becoming a scapegoat himself. John eleven forty nine. 49. Oh, this is some good stuff. I hate to waste it on y'all on a Wednesday night while you're tired and cold and ready to go home, but I'm going to let you go early so you can get, because Friday night, I want to see how good you're going to be looking. Ooh, you got to, you can start your makeup tonight. You want it to be ready by, by Friday. Oh, my God. It's going to be all right on Friday. I'm going to see you're going to be all right. All right, John 11, 49 through 53. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Now, he didn't say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied. So sometimes God will prophesy through unsaved people. We can't even hear it through saved folks. Can you hear it through? He prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. 
And not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. You know, the more I read the Bible, the more strange it becomes. The more I read the Bible, the more I learn, the more I figure out and learn about God. The more I learn about God, the more I figure out I don't know about God the more it is becoming more, more, more powerful, more exciting, more. So that's how it ought to be. So if you're here and you're saying, I don't know if I understand what you're talking about. Good! That's where you should be because that means you're growing. Because as long as you sit here and amen your arrogance and think you know everything I'm talking about, you're not growing. And, of course, Irenaeus said that God created us to grow and to mature. And if you ever stop growing, you're dead. I'm just telling you what the, what the early church fathers said. You're dead. You're created to grow into the image and be conformed to the image of his dear son. So a scapegoat visit, victim is chosen when two or more warring groups, that's what we've been talking about, want to seek to end the escalation of violence by blaming an outside person or group for the sins of all. So two, two, two parties, two factions are fighting. They say, how do we end the group? They blame a third party and come to agreement in order to end the fighting and create peace in the days of Jesus the greatest rivalry that existed was between the Roman Empire and the Israelite religion yet Caiaphas recognizes or realizes in John eleven fifty 50 that in order to create peace between politics and religion a single victim could be chosen by both parties to bear the blame for all Y'all missed it, didn't you? That last phrase there says, from that day on, they planned together to kill him. Isn't it interesting? Church people can't get together to do nothing but kill somebody else. They can't get together to do right. They can't get together to pray. They can't get together to work. But it's, when it's time to kill somebody... All of a sudden, they can come together, these religious folks. The religious folks came together with the politicians, and through the arrest, trial, and crucifixion of Jesus, the two warring sides of the conflict came together and created peace. Jesus submits himself to the process to expose it for what it is and to call us to live a different way. He tells us how we ought to live. On Facebook Live on Tuesday night, I talk about this and I let it go. We, Jesus uh, the, the said, I send you out as sheep among wolves. And then if you go over, that's Matthew. If you go to Luke, he said, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Can I talk about this a little bit? If he sends you out as a sheep, he sends you out with no weapons, no protection. Sheep are the most defenseless animals in the world. Lambs, I send you out as sheep, I send you out as a lamb. Not to the church picnic, not to work, but among wolves. Now, he's talking to the disciples, the apostles, and he said, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. So that means you ought to understand that your life is to be spent among people who are attacking you, but you never fight back. Oh, I'm not getting no amens on that. You never fight back. You never, because you are a sheep. And I want you to be as wise as a serpent. I'm just, I'm just quote, quoting the scripture, but I want you to be as harmless as a dove. I want you to be smart. I want you to be sharp. I want you to look. I want you to use discernment. I want you to act and, and know how you ought to act. But if it comes to violence, I want you to act like a dove. I want you to act like a sheep. I want you to act like a lamb. I was waiting on, I was waiting on some shouting. I was waiting on some shouting. I'm not getting any. I send you out as sheep. He didn't say I send you out as lions. I send you out as dogs. I send you out as sheep among wolves. So what happened is I started looking at that. I'm getting ready to go, but I'm, I'm, you know I'm getting wound up here. I was getting ready, getting ready to let you go. But, so I went and I started looking at the shepherd. 
And as I looked at the shepherd, I said, well, certainly the shepherd, I've, I've always been taught, and I used to teach, and I've been reading it and studying it, but I, can get, I got a whole new perspective now, that the shepherd had a rod, and the rod was used to protect the sheep and himself. But the more I read it, the rod wasn't to protect him. It was to protect the sheep. Because the sh as Christians, this is where we get messed up now, you are a shepherd and a sheep. You're both. As the shepherd, you protect anybody around you that looks like they're going down there in trouble or whatever. You get your rod out and you're ready to fight. You're not going to kill the sheep. You're not going to kill this lamb. But when they attack you, you're a sheep and you don't fight. I'm not hearing nobody. David speaking as a sheep said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He's making me to lie down in green pasture. Just go home and read it. It's all about, as a sheep, what God's going to do for him because he can't do nothing for himself. As sheep, then, we don't fight. That's what Jesus said because he's trying to tell us that we don't do violence. The only time we do violence is on somebody else's behalf. So now y'all know if you want to beat somebody up, it's got to be because they did something to somebody else. <laughs> Not to you. Not to you. But somebody, they hurt a sheep, they hurt a lamb. And you're trying to protect that lamb. Then now you can go ahead and use your rod. Boom. And fight and defend, but not for yourself. Wengren says, we preach the gospel because everybody preaches. Even though there may be those who do it corporately and publicly for the church, but there are, everybody does it privately and, 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 and for, for themselves in terms of their spheres of influence, what God has called them. We preach the gospel in the power of the Holy Ghost, expecting, accepting whatever comes to us and not expecting success and not fearing opposition. Oh, I feel like preaching right there, but I got to go. I got to let you go. I see you shine in your shoes right now. Friday night is coming. You accept, we accept as, as, as those who have been sent out into the world to represent Jesus. We accept, we, we know, we cannot expect success. Amen. And killed all the amens. No, that's not about success. And we can't fear opposition. Because we're going to be among wolves. But we're going to do what God calls us to do, give our lives and perhaps save some lambs, save some sheep. That's what he called us to. Well, that's hard saying. That's what Jesus said. He said it was a hard saying. But I'm just trying to help you. Because if you ever get a piece of it, any little bit of it, it's going to transform your life. And you're going to understand why violence and nonviolence becomes so important. Why you need to not fight for yourself. Because when you do that, you are betraying the one who came and died on Calvary without fighting. His only weapons were the word of God, love, and forgiveness. Well, y'all not going to say amen. So let's, so let's pray. Father, thank you that you have loved us with an everlasting love. And you sent your son and he came and volunteered to enter into death and to die so that he might rescue us from death. Thank you that you have won the battle without striking one blow. You won through the power of your word and the power of your blood and the word of the testimony and forgiveness and love you overthrew the devil and snatched us from from hell's gate and brought us back into eternal life and you said brought to light life and immortality 
through what it is that you did when you came to this earth. We thank you tonight. Without you, I wouldn't be standing here. Without you, I wouldn't be saved. Without you, I would have no hope. Without you, I would be of all men most miserable. But because of you and what you have done, we glorify you and praise you. On Friday night, allow the celebration to break out that we might thank you for 45 years of your grace and your mercy. Thank you. Glory to God. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You thought I was playing with you, didn't you? I told you I'm going to let you out early. <laughs>